Hi everyone, I'm Rose Martin and we are right around the corner in Blacksburg, Virginia at the Alexander Black House. This is an historical building and we're going to hear all about it and why our guest writer for today, Angie Smybert, chose it. Her book, Bones Gift, is a supernatural historical mystery set in about 1942 in a southwest Virginia coal mining town. 12-year-old Bone, she's got some special gifts. She can touch an object and know its story. Her family has some too. It's going to be fascinating and thanks for joining us. Hi Angie, welcome to Right Around the Corner. Well, thanks for having me, Rose. And tell me, why did you choose the Alexander Black House for your segment? Well, I knew that they were having an exhibit on coal mining in Blacksburg and that's, my book is set in 1942 in a little coal mining community outside of Blacksburg. And also the building has sort of like a family connection as well. Mm. We weren't part of the Black family, but the McCoy family had this um, building for many, many years as a, a funeral home. Oh, really? Yeah. And um, they still have a funeral home um, on the other side of town. And they sold this building to the town, I think, maybe 20 years ago. Well, it's a beautiful right. facility, so I'm glad you chose it. Yeah. Outside of this building, though, you also have a family history with coal mining, don't you? Yeah, I do, yeah. Um, well, and that was, this was part of writing the, process, the book, was finding out a lot of this stuff that I didn't really realize that, well, my grandfather and all his brothers were coal miners. And they came from uh, McCoy, a little, you know, if you go out Price's Fork Road and until you hit the river, that's McCoy. And, you know, and I'd always been there, visit grandparents and whatever, but I didn't really realize that, yeah, they were coal miners up until the 50s. Hmm. Now, did those stories, did, were they telling stories that you heard? That Was that part of w growing up where the idea for storytelling came from? Oddly not. That They really didn't talk about it. Um, and that's why it was kind of a surprise later when I found out, you know, how deep the connection was. Um, and I really didn't start looking at, you know, this part of my past or my mom's past. Because I grew up in Blacksburg. She grew up in the McCoy area. Mm -hmm. And you know, really felt like I started looking at all this a little too late because a lot of, you know, get to be in your 40s and 50s and those people that were, you know, doing this back then, well, they're, you know, not a lot of them are around anymore. So I studied some oral histories that like Radford University did, you know, talked to the aunts and uncles that are still around and did that kind of research, yeah. Were they open about sharing those stories? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And and now um, one of my aunts is in the process of like, she's decided we have like great aunts and uncles who are in their 90s, and she's like, oh, I better get these be stories before you know before they're yeah gone. before they're gone yeah, absolutely. Exactly. So let's go back. Tell me about a young Angie, five, six, seven year old. <laughs> what what was she like? Um, a nerdy little tomboy, um, and. I was, you know, I was probably a little bit like this character because um, I, I was the kind of girl who, yeah, I didn't, I, I liked to wear my jeans. I didn't like dolls or anything like that. You know, I liked to play with the boys and rough and tumble and while still like reading books and watching old movies and loving science fiction and all that sort of stuff. Did you have some favorite books? Um, yeah, I remember reading as a kid, like the, you remember like the Walter Farley horse books and things like that, but I was so nerdy, like in sixth grade, I decided I'm going to the library, this one over here, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to start on this shelf, I'm going to make a list, and I'm going to read the, you know, Wuthering Heights and, you know, and whatever else comes next, so all the classics. And Did you do it? Yeah, I got, I, I probably didn't read the whole shelf, but, mm -hmm. but I may, I remember making a list and reading like Wuthering Heights and Sid Hartra and all sorts of stuff that you wouldn't think like an 11 or 12 year old would get. Well, and you <laughs> love that age group, which right, makes it yeah. so wonderful. So yeah. I wonder, you know, you found your love of reading when you were in middle school <clears throat> at that, at that age. What do you find that speaks best to that age group from some of the work that you do by targeting, you know what, I really want to really want to touch the lives of those middle school kids. Well, I think it's important not to assume what they're going to be interested in and talk and write down to them, you know. They're going to be interested in the things that you're interested in in a lot of ways. And 
you know, and if I'm interested in story, you know, you know, Appalachian folk tales and weird mysteries or science fiction and um, working, you know, social justice kind of things, you know, there's going to be a kid writer that's interested in a lot of the same things. Did you have family members or teachers that actually did that with the Appalachian folklore or no. any of those things that really sparked that with you and you think, you know what, I've got to learn more about that. I want to know those Not stories. Not at all. I don't even remember as a kid hearing those stories other than maybe my mom telling me like uh, Br'er Rabbit stories or really? something. Yeah. So it wasn't until I came at, at that as an adult, you know, I kind of like diving into back into the stories and realizing yeah this is my own my own background mm -hmm. you know I should know this stuff and mm -hmm. yeah did you write a lot of stories growing up or tell a lot of stories was it fantastical <laughs> if, if you love the nonfiction, or were you out there like creating own worlds and sharing that I had a lot of stories in my head I don't necessarily I didn't necessarily write them all down because I was busy like oh I think I'm going to be like a veterinarian or something like that and I better you know you know, I can't make a living as a writer. <laughs> you know, right. those are, those who are the does kind that? Of, those are the kind of things I, I was thinking, you know, through high school and college, and what am I doing now? I'm a writer. So, so yeah. and that's interesting, because <laughs> yeah. you, you started out wanting to be a veterinarian and love science and math, mm -hmm. and I love that, that strong girls are great in STEM, right? Right, yeah. And I think that's awesome. And then you ended up in NASA for 10 years. What were right. you doing at NASA? Well, I was hired to write online training for, um, well, and actually... I sort of helped pioneer, this is back in the 90s before anybody had online training, so we kind of helped pioneer that. And so I wrote things like, you know, this is how you x, you know, x-ray a shuttle or... Um, I did well, not too many people know how to uh, x-ray yeah, a shuttle. I so. know a lot of weird things, I'll say that, you know, like how to x-ray shuttles and how to, you know, um, in a previous job we worked a lot with uh, nuclear energy and nuclear waste and and writing about it and like how do you explain this to the public kind of thing but at NASA yeah I had a digital I would ended up being the head of a digital media lab we did this kind of thing we went out and filmed stuff and we did not um, you know for training purposes and we made CDs and uh, websites and that kind of thing but I did mostly the writing and I taught myself a lot of the um, the coding um, you just, taught yourself coding. Yeah, just because, wow. yeah, you kind of, you know, oh, we can't afford to hire somebody. I'll learn it, you know, that kind of thing. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you've got your own gifts. I think you're chatting about <laughs> Bones gifts, as right. we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Yeah. But those seems like some pretty great Angie gifts oh, that, you. that you bring to the world. Oh. And outside of NASA, you've had some other interesting careers along the way, some yeah. other interesting jobs. Mm -hmm. All mostly doing science writing. Um, actually, worked at Virginia Tech for a couple, um, four or five years. And I was, that was where I was working with a Department of Energy and we were doing, um, you know, we were running workshops on environmental restoration and I was writing like booklets and, you know, questions you have about environmental cleanup, you know, and for the public, that kind of thing. Well, and that brings me, because I'm curious, you have novels, you right. have short stories, right. you have nonfiction, you have such this great plethora of work. Right. Uh, how do you kind of decide, is it just an interest base or where you want to go next? Um, well, with the nonfiction, it's often, oh, maybe I need some money, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, but the, because that kind of work is, has kind of like, fallen in my lap like I know that stuff so I can go write about you know space mm -hmm. or some of those mm -hmm. things and I love it yeah and you know and it, it, it is it is kind of like oh I think like right now I have like I'm writing a book on board games um, one on computers and I just finished up one on artificial intelligence plus working on the second and third book of the Bone series. Okay, I, mean, so to say, I need to I take know. a minute there to yeah. even realize that. Right. So you, a book on board games, a book on artificial intelligence, right. the second and third of the trilogy of this one, and what was the, what was the other oh, thing? Oh, there's a, one on computers. One like, on computers. Like how they work. Kind how of. on earth do you keep all that straight? Sometimes I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, I have to be like, okay, today I'm working on this. You know, I have to compartmentalize a little bit. Um, did you have a family of writers, a family of scientists? Uh, my about. dad was a scientist. Um, he was a professor at Tech for 30-some years, and 
uh, world-class scientist in microbiology. So that's where that love of science came yeah, from. Yeah. Do you keep up with things now? You had mentioned the book on artificial intelligence. So are you keeping up on all of those interesting yeah. new developments that are happening in science? Uh, I do, and out of my own sort of intense curiosity, like, oh, that's cool. Well, you know, let me uh, research that and see what that was all about. And that's what I was thinking yeah. about, because you have this great breadth of, of work, so it's yeah. that intense curiosity that you yeah. decide, oh, this is interesting to me. I think I might want to write about that next. Right, and a lot of times I get story ideas from that, too, because mm -hmm. there's some cross-pollination of, like, you know, that's where I came up with the idea for Memento Nora. I was looking into some research on memory and found, oh, well, there's, oh, somebody really is working on a pill like this to help people forget, you know, bad experiences and just that bad experience. And that is such yeah. a great series, yeah. a great trilogy yeah. that you have with Thank Memento you. Nora. So it starts out, share a little bit about it. Well, it's a young adult science fiction and it starts out where it's a world where you can just go down to the corner and, you know, instead of a Starbucks, there's a therapeutic forgetting clinic and you can go in and say, I want, I, you know, I want to forget this horrible experience. And you just, you know, take a pill and go on with your life. And you forget. Right. And, and then in book two? Well, book t uh, the book two and three is kind of, like in book one, the main character, uh, Nora, figures out that, oh, maybe there's a reason that you ought to remember some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So two and three is a little further down the rabbit hole of what the kids, because um, they're all like 14 and 15, who you know she becomes friends with, and they're all doing this. Uh, uh, you know, they're working to find out what's really going on in this. This, you know, it's a near future world. When you lay out a, a series like yeah. this, what's that process like for you? Do you know from the very beginning? Do you outline all three books? Uh, yes and no. Like, um, like for this, the Bones Gift series, I've outlined all three books, and so I know kind of you know, and they they'll change as I write them. Um, for the Memento Nora one, I, I did outline the first one and then I didn't realize there was a second and third one until I got to the end and then my editor made some comment and said, well, I don't, you know, I don't think she would, at the very end, I don't think that the character would remember this or something would happen. Mm -hmm. I don't want to give the ending away, but, and I was like, oh, you're right. Uh, and that's kind of where the second and third book came from. Do you have a do you have a process every day? Do you, are you regimented like you go to work and you write, or yeah. do you, how does that work for you? Uh, I treat it like a job. I have you know I work at home, but I have a office. You know, so you know, I go eat my breakfast, feed the animals, go up and sit in my chair, and you know, from like nine to five, more or less. Oh, so you're it's really regimented yeah. for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I vary the times if I need to go do something, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, I treat it like, a, a, you know, it's a put your butt in the chair kind of job. Right. What do you think makes a great story? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I think a great story hits all the right buttons in the reader that you feel like you, uh, you're there with the, there, you're there in the world, you're there with the character, you believe all his or her choices as they're going through and you you know you may not like what they did but you you're invested in what they're doing and you get to the end and you don't feel like oh well that was that was a cheat <laughs> you know mm -hmm. so that was kind of like you know it's an emotional response to the story I think. So do you yeah. do that when you develop your characters for a story you kind of think mm, you might do that you might not but yeah I really do even if I start with like an idea first for the story, I build the characters. And then I think about, well, what, was, what would this character really do in this situation? Mm -hmm. And I might write out a whole bunch of different scenarios, you know, like, okay, if you did that, you did that, or did that. But really, you know, I feel like this, the character drives the story. And how do you decide then which voice gets to be the dominant one that's going to carry the story? Um, you kind of experiment a little bit, but I think with, for instance, like with Bone's Gift, I started out like doing both Bone and Will as voices, mm -hmm. um, two characters, and then I realized, well, it's really, I want it to be Bone's story. And for middle grade, which is just a little bit younger than YA, 
you know, typically you have like one strong voice. In and why I'm in a young adult. Right, exactly. And that's more the teenagers. Um, I kind of hit, I write for kind of like the young teenagers, older middle graders, I guess. And why do you think your books resonate with them? I don't know. I, I hope they do. Um, well, and you've got great resources online for teachers, which yeah. is something different. I mean, right. I think your background writing the STEM materials, mm -hmm. your background loving science, right. I think it's wonderful that yeah. teachers can go to your website and think about a way that they can use these books right. in the classroom. Yeah. Why is that important for you that, the, that it wouldn't just be something the kids might go to the library and get, right. but that the teachers would introduce readers to your books? Well, I think there's a lot of ways that kids can interact with the books, and if the um, teacher wants to use it, or a librarian wants to use it in their classroom, then I want to, like, it's kind of fun for me to come up with, oh, here's an activity they could do, like a game or something. Um, or, for instance, like for Bones Gift, I had a professor at Ferrum do, like, all the Appalachian folk tales. You know, here's what, you know, because she's, that's what, that's her specialty, hmm. um, Tina Hanlon. And so, you know, I had her go through and, you know, she has that on her website. But I think those things help, you know, both the teachers and the student, the, the readers, get more out of the book. Well, one thing I love about it, I'm definitely over 12, but yeah. I enjoyed it. Good. And so I think it actually can resonate and speak to people who maybe haven't picked up a book in a while or maybe who want so. to read yeah. aloud to their kids yeah. or their grandkids. Mm -hmm. What a great way to start a story like that. And um, I think even with some of the Momentum Nora books, I read somewhere that you wanted your books to even appeal to a reluctant reader. Right. Who was a reluctant reader? Um, kind of what you said. It, it's somebody who hasn't book, picked up a book or a uh, a kid that's intimidated by reading um, and you know looks at a big you know 800 pound book and says oh I can't get yeah, through that no nope. <laughs> but oh I can get through that one and mm -hmm. you know the you know the pace is fast enough at least for the memento Nora ones I think that it's like you know kids were like oh that's you know let's you know let's keep going with this mm -hmm. yeah you mentioned the Appalachian folk tales mm -hmm. how have you woven those into your work well the in the Bones Gift, or the, the whole series is called Ghost of Ordinary Objects. Um, I kind of wanted it to be like almost a folktale itself, too. But in the uh, story, Bone loves all these folktales. And she knows, she's a born storyteller, and she knows all the ones that are, you know, from the area, or, you know, even Cherokee folktales and all sorts of other things. So she loves telling them. And at the time, there was also people from the Virginia Writers Project uh, was part of the Works Progress Administration who went throughout Southwest Virginia collecting these kind of stories. So I kind of I created a character who comes and collects those stories. And Bone, you know, she's got her own little mystery to solve, but she's helping out, and it's kind of cover for what she wants to find out about. I love that yeah, part of the story, yeah. that she could go and find out these stories right, and yeah. quiz everybody about their whole lives. I'm fascinated with the Appalachian folk tales and the mm -hmm. Cherokee folk tales that you bring in. How do you weave the Cherokee in? Um, the one Cherokee tale I used was called um, Forever Boy, because it really seemed to resonate with Bone herself. And I have um, the uncle, Uncle Ash, you know, teases her and calls her a forever girl because she likes this story and she kind of lives this story. And Forever Boy, uh, the Cherokee folk tale was that Forever Boy uh, didn't want to grow up, didn't want to, like, take on any adult responsibilities. And he ran, you know, and he was sent to live with an uncle who was going to teach him. So instead, he ran off to the woods where the little people live. And so he could be a boy forever. And so it's kind of a Peter Pan right. kind of thing. That's what I was yeah, thinking. yeah, exactly. So she's a forever girl, so Peter Pan. You well, know. I think those having those yeah. parts of the story woven in mm -hmm. to to her gift and how the story plays out just right. makes it much more interesting for everyone. It was fun for me because <laughs> I enjoy those stories. Well, and that's yeah. what makes any book great yeah. is that you enjoy writing it and we mm -hmm. enjoy reading it. it are Bone or any of the characters based on real people? Um, not really. I borrowed a lot of real names. Um, from that area, but I didn't like particularly base like a character on anybody. 
the kind of sort of a, an amalgam of different people. So the story opens where, mm -hmm. you know, you've got Bone, this 12 year old girl, mm -hmm. and she's reluctant a little bit with her special gift, mm -hmm. but realizes the family also has a lineage of gifts. Right. Share a little bit about that without giving too much away. Okay. Well, she's coming of that age where her gift is coming on and she's not all that happy about it. Um, she can touch an object and see what the, see maybe what happened to the person that owned that, you know, or came across that. And, well, and it's either, you know, really good memories or really bad ones. And she's kind of dealing with a, she didn't want to know these stories in the first place. She likes, re, you know, she likes stories about princesses and gypsies mm -hmm. and things like that, but not real life kind of things is because the storytelling is kind of escape for her. And so, of course, her gift is she has to know, you know, the real life story of things. And she has some mysteries to solve where she gets right. to use that gift. Right. And the cover of your book has a yellow sweater right. on the cover. Mm -hmm. And that's really an important part of the story, too. How so? Well, this is an object that it used to belong to her mother and her mother died um, several years ago. And part of the mystery that Bone has to solve is, well, what really happened with her mom? Mm -hmm. And you know, what kind of gift did she have? And so this, the, what, the sweater is kind of giving her hints along the way. And, you know, and she doesn't want to hear some of them and then she's intrigued. And, yeah. and so every book in the series is going to have, there's be a different object that's kind of that main thing where she has to dive into and figure out what's going on with it. And are her family members also, are their gifts still going to be there? Like her uncle who mm -hmm. was with the animals right. and the, is it the aunt with the herbs who does all the natural? Her, her grandmother, her, grandmother. her okay. mama is uh, an herbalist, but her gift is she can touch a plant and find out like, oh, this would be good for, you know, heart disease or something like that. She can see what it does. Whereas the uncle, he can see what's, um, put a hand on an animal and see what's wrong with it. And her mom's gift was a healer. Right. And I can see why, I can see why kids and young adults and adults will enjoy the book right. because it's fascinating to follow them along the journey mm -hmm. and then have these things kind of, right. kind of, these things just kind of show up for them and right. then find the way that you resolve it all yeah. at the end. So in the second and third book, Bone's also going to have this, the same ability for touching right. the objects. Right, and it's, she's going to be getting more and more comfortable with it and finding out more and more things. Mm. Does Angie have any of these special gifts? Did you base any of these on <laughs> Angie's gifts? No. <laughs> no, my gift I, maybe is the uh, figuring out the story. <laughs> but, um, and somebody else asked me that recently, too. Do you have one of those gifts? And I'm like, no. And then she proceeded to tell me that she had one. Oh, that's so, interesting. Well, I'm not going to yeah, be able to share yeah. that because okay. I don't. But yeah. I would like you to share the gift of your book. Would you read a passage for sure. us? Sure. Okay. Well, we'll and set, set it up for us. I'll set this up. This is um, the Will is her best friend. And he's a little bit older than her. And he's just gotten a job in the mine. And he needs to go get his um, gear from the store. Mm -hmm. Well, he doesn't speak. Uh, and so Bone's always kind of been his voice, her, you know, his voice mm -hmm. in these situations. So they're going together to the country store. Now, one thing I didn't mention before was that my grandfather ran the country store in oh, this, in this, um, I based this loosely on McCoy, but I call it Big Vane instead. But um, so this is kind of, you know, I thought he was also a miner in McCoy and got hurt and then decided, and then he ran, took over running the store from his father. So I used his name in here. So. Okay. So, okay. So, um, Will held open the screen door as Bone marched into the store, past the old men playing checkers on the Cracker Barrel, plus past the RC Colas frosting in the cooler and the Red Goose work boot stacked on the shelf, right up to the counter. Uncle Junior and Mr. Price were standing there jawing with Mr. Scott, who ran the commissary. Bone cleared her voice. Uh, Mr. Scott, Will Kincaid here has himself a job at Big Vane, she announced. Well, I got what, she, what, he, what he needs, Miss Bone. He grinned and then he looked Will up and down a bit and then went back to the back room. 
Will shifted from foot to foot while the men were hanging about the store, slapping him on the back and shaking his hand. We could use a big strong one like you down there, Mr. McCoy said. Will stood even taller as Uncle Junior shook his hand. Will was a half a head taller than most of the men in the room, except of course Uncle Junior. Both of Mama's brothers were like trees blowing in the wind. Um, we take care of our own will, Uncle Junior said. He winked at Bone, which made her feel better. Her uncle had been in the mines even longer than her daddy, and he'd look after them both. But he, she also knew it meant something else. Will was only 14, but on account of his size and his daddy's death, the mine super turned a blind eye to Will's age when he scratched 16 on the form. Everyone in Big Van Camp knew how old everyone else was, but they also thought Will would never make it through high school or get drafted or even get a job at the powder plant over in Radford, not without a voice. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate you sharing your work, and I can't wait to read the other two books. Okay. And I hope that schools will pick them up also and share them with their students. I hope so, too. So <laughs> a special thanks to Angie Smybert for sharing all of her work with us, and also to the Alexander Black House for their hospitality while we had a chance to chat with Angie today, learn about Bone and all of her gifts. And I think we have a takeaway, right, that we can also learn about our gifts and be okay to use them and be appreciative of them. Thank you all for joining us and I'll see you next time because we're going to be right around the corner.